to become used the most, that's what it will be. Now, Korea is in the expanding circle. So that's where we think of English as a foreign language. And that's where the vast majority of people studying English today, they're in countries like Korea, where the people don't have many, many opportunities to use English outside of the classroom, and yet they're working hard to learn it. The expanding circle, why? Well, I think there's more, there's many, many people in the United States who are, who are bilingual. But the majority, the vast majority of people in the United States know English. And maybe not as their first language, but as their second. All right, but, but you bring up a good point because these lines now, these so-called circles that seem to be very distinct in color and, and difference, aren't that way at all. You get a country like Germany or Denmark or Sweden, that would be in the expanding circle. And if you ever travel in those countries, you don't have to go very far at all. And people speak English. Germans will be speaking English to one another, or Swedes will be talking English to one another. So you get what's expanding, what's outer. They're, they're really becoming very, very much blurred. And that means that you have to look at the individual instead of looking at the country. For example, all of you are, are Korean and very fluent English speakers. You really fit more in what might be called the outer circle, but that isn't what this circle says. So we have to talk about people who have very little understanding of English, people like yourself that are fluent bilinguals, and people who are native speakers and monolingual. So English is being used with great differences among the people of the world. So in order to be an international language, it has to be widely spoken. But that's not enough, because then Mandarin would be an international language. So what else does it take to be an international language? Well, Smith talks about various things that it takes to be an international language. First of all, if it's international, there's no need to internalize the cultural norms or values of L1 speakers. What that means is if it's international, and if, for example, a Korean is learning English, there's no necessity for them to know about the culture of Great Britain, of the United States, of Australia that it's an international language, so it doesn't belong anymore to that particular country. Otherwise, it wouldn't be international. It wouldn't be a world language. So an international language, he says, becomes denationalized. It doesn't belong to any country. It belongs to the people who use it. And the third one is very important for your day-to-day -day activities in your classroom. The purpose of teaching an international language is to facilitate communication of learners' ideas and culture in an English medium. What that means is that the reason for teaching English in Korea is to be able to tell the rest of the world about Korea, to say, these are our values, these are the economic problems we're having, um, these are the things that we want to promote about our country. It's for telling other people about your own country, not learning what the inner circle is doing or looking to the inner circle. So that means that a lot of what happens in a language classroom, an English language classroom, should be preparing students to let people know about their own country and their own issues. Now another person who's talked about the features of an international language is Brut Griffler who is Polish, a second language speaker, highly proficient. I, I'm trying to avoid the term native, non-native, because I think that it doesn't mean anything. I think we need to talk about, do you know English and how well do you know it? Instead of, was that, that the language your mother used or not? When you think about native language, it really is, is it your mother tongue? Did your mother speak it? Well, maybe that, maybe your mother did speak it, 
but maybe your father spoke another language. So then, what's your mother tongue? Is it only because your mother speaks it, but what if your father spoke to you more? Then you have all this idea of, well, what is a native speaker? What's, the, what's your mother tongue? So we, we really need to do away with that. Instead, talk about how well do you know English? So Ruth Rickler is happy that her mother tongue was Polish, but um, she is perfectly bilingual and highly proficient in English. So she says, a world language is the development of a world econo-cultural system. So a world language happens when there's a world economy, a global economy. And certainly that's what we have today, where people are trading in all, all kinds of trading agreements are happening between various countries. And, and goods and services are moving from one country to another very rapidly. And so you need a language to be able to do that kind of trade. You're not just trading with the people that are very close to you, but now you're trading with people miles and miles away from you. And it's a product of a global culture. Now, for many people, that's, that's a danger. That's something that people are working to avoid. People will say, we don't want to become a McDonald culture. We don't want to have only the mass media of the United States. We don't want to have only rock music. We have our own values and our own ways of doing things. And so I think for many people, it's a concern. How can I keep my own culture and not become part of this sort of global culture that wherever you go, you're going to see Starbucks and you're going to see McDonald's and you're going to see all the same things. Isn't there something different and unique? Now, the second thing is that a world language tends to establish itself along other languages, along local languages. And this means that people, many people who speak English today have another language. And in the vast majority of cases, that language is the language of their family, of their friends. It's the language that serves all their informal purposes. And English becomes more for public uh, purposes, for reading, for things like that. And I think that should make us think about, well, what do we want our textbooks to do? And what do we want to, um, what do we want to do in our classrooms? Should we teach students um, familiar, informal language? Is that what they're going to be using English for? Or will they be using it for more formal purposes? And that should then, we decide, what kind of dialogues will we use? What kind of um, tasks will we give in our language classroom if we're trying to make sure they know languages mainly for English, mainly for formal purposes? Then she says, a world language, unlike an elite lingua franca, is not confined to the economic elite. This would mean that if it's a world language, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter, it matter if your mother and father have a college degree or not, you should speak it because it's a world language. But I don't think that's the way English works today. That in most areas, it's those that can afford it and are motivated are those that learn English well. Because it takes time and it often takes money to get good language instruction. So in a way, what we've got is a global language of, in a way, more economically, economic elite and, and educational elite. And if we want to let everybody participate in the values of a world language, then I think everyone's got to work to make sure everybody who wants to learn it can do that. And then finally, a world language spreads not by speaker migration, but by macro acquisition of the language. This means that earlier, the reason English spread was from people left Great Britain and they went to the United States. And they left Great Britain and they went to Australia, New Zealand, Canada. So people were moving and they brought English with them. They were probably monolingual when they left. They were monolingual when they got in their new place. But that isn't what's happening today. People are staying right where they are and they're learning English and they're learning it alongside this other language they're using. And so that's why these people have two, they